Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. This is a big crowd. Uh, my name is James Saryawini. I am a software development engineer at AWS. I work on the SDKs and tools team. So some of the things that I work on include Boto3, which is the AWS SDK for Python. I also work on the AWS CLI, which is our command line interface for working with AWS. And I also work on another project called Chalice, which is a serverless micro framework for Python. We're going to look at that today. So today's talk is a crash course on serverless applications in Python. So maybe if uh, you've heard of serverless computing, but you're not exactly sure what it is or what the benefits are, or if you've heard of it and you're not really sure how to get started, then this talk is for you. So what we're going to look at today is mainly three things. We're going to look at an overview of serverless computing, what it is, some of the core services that make up our serverless computing platform. And then we'll look at serverless architecture and how we can start thinking about designing applications to work in serverless computing. And then finally, we see how we can take these concepts and actually write applications in Python. And we'll see uh, some tools and some frameworks available to make that easy for us. So let's first, let's talk about serverless computing. I think one of the main reasons that serverless computing is really appealing to people is that it allows you to create applications without having to think about managing servers. So you don't have to worry about things like um, you don't have to worry about things like how to update your OS, how to manage system packages, how to manage a fleet of servers. So thinking of how you want to scale, when you should scale up, when you should scale down, making sure you're taking care of details like deploying to multiple availability zones and having the appropriate health checks so that you have high availability and fault tolerance. You're essentially taking all of that and you're offloading that responsibility to the serverless compute platform. And the main service that's going to underpin a lot of the things we're going to talk about today is AWS Lambda. Uh, the nice thing about AWS Lambda is you take the code that you want Lambda to run, you give it to Lambda, and then you configure it in certain ways to run based on certain events happening. And we'll look at a lot of that in the second section here. But one of the other things that's great about Lambda is that you only pay for the compute time that your function is running. So for example, if I have something that takes a second to run, then I'm only billed for a second of compute time. And it's rounded to the nearest 100 millisecond. So if we start, let's start from the very beginning and try to build up. So what we'll do is we'll take a normal Python function and then just slowly start to introduce Lambda. And then we'll start to integrate with other services. And we'll see how this can build into a serverless application. So let's take this function here. And if we start with just a normal Python function where we've defined um, this thing called handler and it takes two parameters, we're not really going to look at the second parameter. This is just the interface that Lambda needs in order to run your function for you. But let's say I have this function here and it returns this hello world. And if I was going to save this in an app.py file and run this locally, it's pretty straightforward. I would just, in the REPL, you know, type Python. If I'm in the same directory, import app, and then just run app.handler, and it would run this function for me, and I would get my results back, right? So, so far, it's pretty straightforward. If I wanted to do the same thing with Lambda, what we would do instead, we could install the CLI. As I mentioned, this is a, one of the things I work on as well. So it's a Python package. You just pip install AWS CLI. And you'll run configure. And we're not going to really get into a lot of the specific details of how to get this all set up. But um, you'll run configure. It'll ask you a couple of questions. And then once you have that ready, you can run this create function command. And what this is going to do is you give it any name that you want. You give it the handler uh, import path there. So it's app.handler, just like what we saw in the REPL. And then you give it the zip file, which is this, uh, this file here, which is just one file for now. And we'll look at actually specifically the commands to make all of this work in, in the last section. This is mostly just for the overview now. But once you have this working, you can then run this invoke command. And what's going to happen is Lambda will run this function for you. And you'll get the same result. You'll get hello world. Now, if we wanted to map input parameters here, we can use that first argument I was mentioning, the event arg. So I provide a payload, and this is just an arbitrary JSON blob. So this is like you know foo and bar. And here, we're going to take the value associated with the foo key, uppercase it, and return it. And we'll get bar. And then if I do the same thing with a different input, I can get a different result. So what's actually happening when you call lambda invoke, uh, there's a couple of things that are, that are happening here. First. If it's the very first time you've run the function, there is a couple of extra things that it's going to do to help set everything up. So first, Lambda, if it sees that it wants to run your code, it will download the code for you. So you send your code to Lambda. You can either send it directly, or you can upload it to S3, and you can tell Lambda where your code is. But it downloads the code for you. It'll then start this new runtime container for you, start bootstrapping your code. I'm going to look at um, how we can take advantage of that in the last section. 
And then finally, it'll actually run your function for you. So uh, if you're starting to get into serverless applications, you'll hear this idea of cold start and warm start. That's essentially what this is. So the very first time you run your code, it has some extra steps it needs to do to set everything up. However, in subsequent invocations, so let's say if I were to do that again, what's going to happen now is it's only going to execute the warm start. So it has that container ready to go, and then it just executes only your function code. So you're going to see uh, generally a much faster response time. It will depend on what your code is actually doing. But the point of all this, and I know that was very quick, but the point of that is that we had a function that was running in locally in our REPL, and to get that running over in Lambda was it's still the same kinds of concepts. We were just having Lambda run our code for us rather than us have to run it. And we didn't have to specify what EC2 instance we wanted to run on. We didn't have to specify anything like um, how many availability zones or any kind of health checks or anything like that. We're able to just focus on what we want our code to do. So now that we have that in place, we can start to see how we can take that building block and then start to create these applications that can do more interesting things. So we'll look at a couple of server, serverless architectural patterns. And when we do that, we also need to think about how we can start designing our applications to take advantage of serverless. And one of the big things, one of the big uh, mindsets that you really have to have when you get into serverless applications is everything is in terms of events. That's probably the easiest way to think of this. So rather than have your code that in you know, a traditional web server or maybe some sort of worker tier would be running in the background periodically pulling for tasks, now instead you have these small units of work that are only going to be run in response to something happening. So let's say an API request comes in or some periodic timer or in response to some messages being put on a queue. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing you'll also start thinking about is that you'll break your function, or you'll break your application into multiple independent functions. Just like you would if you were writing a Python module, you'd break your code up into multiple functions. You'd do, this, you'd do the same thing with Lambda here. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how Lambda will be invoked based on what you're trying to do. So there's three things here. Uh, there's three things we'll look at. The first is a synchronous invocation. So in this first pattern, we saw this in the previous section where you ask Lambda to invoke something for you, and the whole thing will block until you get the result back. And so uh, in this case, we're using the CLI, but perhaps a more uh, common use case would be a GET request. So we have another service uh, called Amazon API Gateway. And what this does is allows you to have different backends for your API, and one of them can be Lambda. So what's going to happen is a user will make a GET request, say, to slash users. And as part of that REST API, API Gateway will invoke the Lambda function. It will block until the Lambda function has, say, retrieved the data from a database or pulled it from some data source, and then returns the value to you. And then that gets formatted as an HTTP response. So that's a really common use case for using Lambda in a synchronous invocation. The second thing is using uh, asynchronous invocation. So this is where you're decoupled from whatever triggers your Lambda function happening um, to what your Lambda function actually does. So another common example here is responding to S3 events. And one that we'll look at in the last section, we'll look at some code to do this, is the image resizer. So the idea is you upload objects to S3, images in particular, and your Lambda function is triggered. It generates a thumbnail or resizes your image or does some sort of processing and then uploads it to another bucket. But what happens here is when you upload an object to S3, the return comes back immediately. So if you're using the AWS CLI or if you're using Boto3 or the console or something, you upload a file and it immediately returns, right? We're not blocking or waiting for Lambda to finish. But what will happen is in the background, S3 will then call Lambda and say that there was a new event that you might be interested in. And then in our code, we'll take that file we'll, or we'll take the object to download it locally to a file, process it with, say, Pillow or some other imaging library. And then from there, we'll upload it to S3 or wherever we want to send our final result. And so in this mode, one of the things to keep in mind is the return result is not actually looked at by the thing that triggered the event. If you notice, um, these are just sequen di sequence diagrams, right? You read left to right, top to bottom. You notice there's no arrow going all the way back to the left. So we don't actually look at the result. Um, and there's we're going to skip over some of the error handling here, but there is some stuff built for built-in retries. So if this does fail, it will retry a couple of times. But essentially, though, the user doesn't see anything that happens for this async invocation. And the last one we're going to look at is streaming or polling. So in this case, there's a couple of streaming uh, services that expose streaming resources. In this example, we have uh, Amazon SQS, which is our queuing service. So the way this works is you can queue messages onto the queue. And then on the, other set, on the other end, you can receive those messages. And those are typically some sort of 
processing job you might need, a new user signs up for a site, or there's some data and some, something you need to analyze. And what would happen normally, if you're not using serverless, you would have some sort of polar, right? You'd have this while true, uh, you know, Bodo 3's SQS client receive messages, and if there's messages, then send them off to whatever is actually going to handle and process that message. But what we can do instead is configure Lambda to do the polling for us. So we can configure it to watch uh, our, an SQS queue for us, and then when Lambda finds messages, and we can configure batch size and how many messages we want and all of that, it will then invoke our Lambda function for us. And then in our Lambda function, you know, we can invoke whatever we want, and we can do whatever processing we want. But the takeaway from here is that we don't actually have to write the polling code ourselves. You generally don't want to be blocking, you don't want to be waiting in your Lambda function because you pay for just the compute time uh, that only the compute time you use. So if you can offload polling or some other sort of coordinating thing to a separate service, that's preferable. And so that's why the stream and this poll uh, method is really useful. So to wrap up the three section or the three types of ways lambdas can be invoked, um, we looked at synchronous ones, which is where you're using either the CLI or you're using API gateway to block until you get a request. There's another mode where it's more event driven. It's more just when so something happens, the lambda function fires, and then it might do some sort of processing on its own. So a couple of other examples of that include timer based things. So uh, you can use lambda essentially as think of it as like a cron service, so you can say every five minutes invoke my Lambda function, and so the event is that the timer is expired. Uh, we also have integration with Amazon SNS, which is where you can publish certain messages. Um, uh, and there's a couple of other services as well. We don't, I'm not able to show all of them on this slide. And then for streaming, there's a couple of uh, additional ones as well. If you're familiar with Amazon DynamoDB, you can integrate with DynamoDB streams, and that can be used to implement things like triggers um, that you would see in other databases and also with Kinesis streams as well. And they all work pretty similar. It's just depending on what streaming resource you're using, the specifics are a little bit different or the, the configuration is slightly different, but the concept is still the same. It will pull for you. OK, so we went through that pretty quickly because I wanted to make sure we had time to spend on writing these serverless applications in Python. So in order to do this, we'll start with our example again, and we'll actually see some of the specifics of how to set all this up. So we take our function that we had from before, and now that we're going to set it up, uh, we're actually going to get this thing running, there's a couple of other concepts we need to keep in mind. So first, we have to figure out how we're going to get all of our code and our dependencies. So one thing we haven't looked at is what if we're going to use, for example, that image resizer pillow, right, or uh, some sort of image processing library, or Boto3, the SDK for Python. So we have to look at how we're going to manage that. We also need to look at our permissions. So by default, your Lambda function doesn't have access to anything. And so you have to explicitly say what it's allowed to do. And so we have to figure out how we can uh, get all of our permissions properly configured for a function. And it's using a thing called IAM roles. And then finally, once that's done, we can create our function. So if we wanted to set this up from scratch using the CLI, we'll look at it from a very simple example first. So this one we can actually just completely do with just normal CLI tools. So first, that step one was create a package, right? We just need a zip file. So in this case, it's a zip file with just a single file. And then next, we need to create a role. And we're going to use the CLI here as well. And uh, we won't get too much into this trust policy, but essentially what it's saying is that Lambda is allowed to assume this role. So Lambda can use this role that we've created. And in this case, we haven't put any actual permissions, like you know, this role can access S3 or DynamoDB. So it can't do anything, which is fine, because we're just returning hello world in this case. And then once we have all of that set up, then we can actually make the create function call. And these are the parameters we'll need here. So first, notice we're referencing the zip file. So we're just sending this file directly to Lambda. It's small enough where we don't, we don't have to upload it to S3, or we don't have to um, create a separate bucket to manage that. So we can send it to Lambda directly. And then the second thing is that we're saying what role we want. So you notice this role that we created, we're providing the role name here. There's a couple of additional things that we can configure as well. Um, probably the only other interesting one, or the only other required one, is the runtime. So here we can say Python 3.6. But Lambda also supports uh, Python 2.7 and a couple of other languages, um, Node, JS, Java, .NET, Go. And there is uh, a few optional parameters I'm not showing here. So you can configure things like how much memory it should use. You can configure um, the timeout, so when the function should um, stop trying to process if it's taking too long. Um, but these are the required fields here. So this wasn't too bad, but if we take an example of, let's say, that resizer, this is with the asynchronous invocation. So this is a, a common use case where we just want to generate thumbnails or maybe generate images based on uh, a mobile device or something, something that's going to be mobile friendly. So if we want to do this, there's a little bit 
uh, more, there's more work involved. And namely, there's, I think, three main things that are going to, um, that we're going to have to keep in mind. So first, we do have to worry about third-party packages. So we're going to be downloading things from S3. So we need an SDK. We need an image processing library. And so we have to figure out how we're going to get that. And it's going to get a little bit tricky because we also have C extensions. So we have to figure out how we can manage that for Lambda. The second thing is that we also need to configure S3 to say, you know, when there's a certain event that happens, configure, uh, make sure you call my Lambda function. So we have to figure out how that's going to work. And then finally, there's permissions, right? So we have to say uh, two things. One, my Lambda function is allowed to access S3. And then the other thing is that S3 is allowed to call my Lambda function. So there's those things there that you have to manage. And there's a number of tools that are available to make this happen. Um, for time, we're not going to talk about uh, SAM, this is a, another tool that we have called Serverless Application Model. Um, it's a great tool. It makes it really easy to write these types of serverless applications. Um, but we're going to go one layer higher to a framework called AWS Chalice. What this is is a Python framework for AWS. And it allows you to create these types of applications really quickly. And it has integration with a lot of AWS services. So it's not just doing, for example, REST APIs or creating Lambda functions. It actually can take the use case that we're looking at and give you a really idiomatic Python API for creating these kind of thing for you. And the way that it works is, you know, we've been looking at this example of a handler where we have this Python code that Lambda's calling for us. And so Chalice has a couple of parts. There's this runtime component that just sits in between that lets you translate something that's just the normal Python function into this, uh, this um, thing here, which looks kind of like Flask, if you've seen that. So you have an app object, and then you have a number of decorators. So this is just app.lambda function. So this is saying, we want to create one lambda function here. I can have multiple at app.lambda functions, and it'll create multiple lambda functions for us. And there's also a CLI component. So once you have all of this in your app.py, you can run Chalice Deploy. And all the steps we saw before, it will take care of. So it will create a deployment package for you. It will create an IAM role for you. And it will create all the Lambda functions that we've decorated. And it also has some nice things in as well, like it will do automatic policy generation. It will scan your source code and look for API calls and try to figure out what policy um, is the least uh, it can scope for you. And once that's done, there's also an invoke command. So this is a, a abstraction over the CLI version. It has some stuff in there to make it a little bit easier to read Python tracebacks and um, uh, a couple of other higher level abstractions in there. But let's see how we can take our example here and actually use Chalice to write this image resizer. So here's the code here, and we'll walk through this in detail. But this is the entire code that you would need to do our use case here, which is resizing an image. And it's about 20 lines or so. And there's a couple of things I'm going to highlight, and there's a couple of tips that I'll point out here as we go through this. The first is that we're just importing a pill here, so from pill import image. And one of the things that's nice about Chalice that it'll handle for you is it will know to download the many Linux one wheel if it's available. And it does that regardless of what platform you're on. Um, it's using the pip API directly. So if I'm on my MacBook here, I can package and deploy my app and make sure it grabs the correct version for uh, Lambda, which is running on Linux. And it works on my Mac. It works on Windows machine. It'll work on Linux. So it, knows, under, it understands C dependencies and how to use the appropriate ones if they're available. Um, another thing here is we're creating a Boda 3 client, and we're specifying it at the module level. So one of the reasons this is useful is if you saw earlier in our slide, we talked about cold start, we talked about warm start. And the nice thing is that as part of the bootstrapping process, it's, um, calling the, uh, it's calling the import during the bootstrap. So it's part of the cold start, which means anything that you're going to use repeatedly. So in this case, we're going to be using the SDK client every time we invoke our Lambda function. We put in the module level so it only happens once. And it's not part of our execution time. It's part of the bootstrapping time. So that's a tip I would suggest. If you have any kind of shared initialization, put it at the module level instead of putting it in your function. Next, this is the part where we start to get into the Python API. So rather than have to, say, update a configuration file that says how we want all of these events to coordinate with each other, we can just decorate this function that says, on this S3 event to this bucket with this prefix, which is essentially the, the thing on the right there that just says anything for images that's star.jpg, call this Lambda function. And so rather than have to figure out what specifically that means, we're just specifying our intent, and then Charles will figure that out for us. And what that's going to do is call our Lambda function. It will also provide a Python object. So if you've worked with Lambda, you get dictionaries, and you have to grab the appropriate keys. This also gives you a Python object, so you get nice auto-completion in your IDE if you're using this. And from here, we're going to download our file, and then we're going to upload it back up to S3. 
But uh, a tip here is to use download file for the SDK. So one of the things, as I mentioned with Lambda, is you get charged for your compute time. So download file is an abstraction over get object. It will use multiple threads and download in parallel and then stitch the file together. So it can download objects faster if it's over a certain th uh, size threshold. And then once we use a uh, download file to download to a temporary file, we will go ahead and uh, resize our image. We're going to use Pillow here. This is one of the great things about the library. It's really simple to use. It's three lines here. Once we do that, we're then going to upload to, uh, we're going to upload back to S3. So here we're just using upload file. It's the parallel, or it's the same thing as download file. It will do parallelized multi-part uploads. So this is just going to save on your execution time as well. So if it's over, I believe, eight megabytes, then it will upload your file in parallel. So what's happening here is that when we do this and we call deploy, Chalice will uh, do a number of things. It will first create the role for you and work out exactly what it needs. It knows that it needs to allow S3 access um, <clears throat> to your Lambda function. It will then take your IAM policy and it'll update your role with the appropriate policies. It will then take your requirements.txt, so it uses the things that we're already familiar with, like a requirements.txt file, and because we have Pillow and we have Bodo 3 in there, it will package it up, find the appropriate many Linux one wheels, and then from there, send it over when it creates the Lambda function. And then, it will also update uh, the S3 event notifications and add the permissions to Lambda to say that this particular uh, bucket, any events that happen, we are allowed to trigger this Lambda function. Now, due to time, we didn't have time to cover a lot of these other things. I just mostly wanted to give pointers, so if you are interested and wanted to start exploring, um, these are a couple of other things it can do. So some of the highlights here, there's app.schedule, so if you want a Lambda function to run every five minutes, that's all you'd have to do is decorate this function here. Um, there's integration with SNS and SQS, and then on the right-hand side, um, there's APIs. So if you wanted more of a REST API, it gives a Flask-style API that integrates with API Gateway. And you can use the app.route and then the authorizers as well to do authorization for your routes. Okay, so we covered those three topics about what serverless computing is, some of the common architectural patterns, and then how we can start writing these applications in Python. I do want to give a quick note since we, we won't have time to cover this, but the, one of the next steps you'll take is you know, how to look at continuous delivery. So once you actually have your application running, how do we get this set up so that we can automatically just, whenever we push to source control, you know, it'll automatically build our, build our application or package it up or whatever it needs and then deploy it to maybe a test or a beta stage, run some integration tests, and then if everything looks good, deploy it to our prod stage. Um, so I will just make, uh, mention real quickly that Chalice does have something to help you with that. It has a local mode, it has the deploy mode, which is what we focused on, but there's also a thing that can generate a pipeline for you. So this is gonna use uh, AWS code pipeline and code build and uh, CloudFormation with SAM templates um, to automatically do a deployment for you. So that was a tour of a lot of the stuff that's involved in writing serverless applications. Some of the next steps here, what I would recommend, if this is interesting and you do want to start exploring this and trying this out for yourself, I would recommend the first two links there. These are tutorials that actually are full-blown serverless apps that walk through everything from getting your dev environment set up, getting it working locally, doing Chalice deploys, setting up a pipeline, uh, watching a code flow through code commit all the way down to um, running on API Gateway. The other one's the media query, so it's kind of taking what we looked at for S3 events and then using uh, another service to look at the image and detect what's there and tag it with certain um, objects that it sees. And it's, it's a, I think it's a really fun tutorial. And then there's a couple of other links here as well. And then if you're feeling uh, really in interested in um, serverless, there's a talk here from reInvent that really gets into how to optimize your Lambda functions, how to really uh, go into a lot of detail of, of really making sure that you're um, following best practices for writing serverless applications. So hopefully you're interested in writing serverless apps. Uh, if you have any questions, I will stick around. I'm not sure how we're doing with time, but um, thanks, everyone. Yeah, I will post the slides online. Do not, no question. Do you have time for questions? Or? Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I will, I will tweet it out. I'll figure out where it goes. Probably on SlideShare or something.